Esta serie documental presenta la investigación, la experiencia y el ejemplo de vida de hombres y mujeres, activistas de una transformación profunda en la sociedad. Sus mensajes hablan del sentido de la Tierra como sistema integral y señalan un horizonte de conciencia nueva y de mayor sensibilidad. Los invitamos a beber del manantial de sus palabras y así poder escuchar las muy diferentes voces de la Tierra. Duan Elgin es orador, autor y visionario social reconocido internacionalmente. Se destaca por observar debajo de la turbulencia superficial de nuestros tiempos para explorar las tendencias más profundas que están transformando al mundo recibió el Premio de Paz en Japón. Actualmente colabora con distintas organizaciones en cine y medios, colegios y universidades. Su activismo es estrictamente transpartidista, representando desde la voz de la comunidad hasta la voz de la Tierra a escala planetaria. So, first of all, I'm a farmer. People ask me, what do you do for a living? I say, I plant seeds. And they're seeds of awakening. They're seeds of a new future, are seeds of a new possibility. I'm still farming, uh, but the seeds I'm planting are in the cultural soil, the social soil of uh, different countries. So I started as a farmer, and then um, jumping ahead, my first job out of college was working on a presidential commission, looking 30 years into the future. So. Uh, I was looking at the whole country from the year 1970 to the year 2000, and that was when I woke up to what was happening in the world that we're seeing now. For three years, I started working in parapsychology at, at one of the biggest think tanks in, in the world. And it was the first research that was ever funded to explore the ecology of consciousness. For three years, I was a paid psychic for NASA to uh, explore the receptive side, what can we receive, and the expressive side, what can we e connect expressing. Um, now that combined with years and years of meditation um, bring me to where I am now, which is looking at a world in crisis, but where is the mindset that has insights for how we can respond? And the, the way of living that we've had in the past is what created the problems. So we can't use that to go into the future. We have to look freshly with new eyes, with new consciousness at where we're going. And that then has been my journey from a farmer to uh, an activist looking with new eyes at a world in transition. I'd been meditating for years before that. And I knew what meditation was about. And it was time not to listen to a teacher, but just to go into silence. And a gift was seeing the aliveness in the universe. That was it. It's what you're looking, it's that we are living in a living universe. And it wasn't simply to see that, it was to experience that deep, deep within. Lineage. Where did I really start from? Well, I started on the land. I started on the farm. I started with animals. I started with dogs and cats and chickens and, and geese. So I started with animals. And they were my original teachers. You know, animals, they, they're there. So if you meet them, you're meeting life. So, how do we bridge the gap between nature and humanity and uh, come together again? We started off in aliveness. 50,000 years ago, we were in a world, uh, immersed in a world of aliveness. And probably for 40,000 years, we were exploring and developing ourselves in that context of aliveness, immediacy magical, mysterious world. Then, 
About 10,000 years ago with the agrarian revolution, farmers started stepping back and saying, okay, I'm looking at nature. Now I see how nature works. It goes around and around. Okay, that's giving me power. My perceptual capacity is giving me power over nature. Move that forward 10,000 years and power over nature, power to exploit nature creates the world we have now. We're on the edge of ruin. We're facing existential crises, which means that we, our very existence is at risk. Our very existence is at risk. And our capacity to stand back from nature empowered us, but then that empowerment led to exploitation. The exploitation has led to ruin. So um, the question is, will the mindset that took us to this place be the mindset that will take us beyond it? And I think not. I think not. Um, the mindset that got us here over the last three or four hundred years is a mindset of separation, of materialism. It says the only reality is a material reality. It's just dead stuff and empty space. And if it's dead, well, there's no consciousness. If it's just empty space, it's empty. Uh, well, what have you got? You just got a bunch of dead matter. Well, how do you know you mattered in this life? Well, how big's your pile of dead stuff? How big's the house? How big's the car? How big's the bank account? That must mean you were, you mattered because your pile of dead stuff was pretty big. Now, there's another way of looking at reality and that's emerging rapidly right now. And it says, no, it's not a bunch of dead stuff. It's a living field. It's a living presence. And what we're trying to do is to come into a relationship with that aliveness. And instead of dominate it in a consumer society, we're dancing with it in a uh, spiritual world, a consciousness world, if you will. And that's the transition that we're trying to make right now uh, to see, well, if it's dead, let's exploit it. If it's alive, let's regard it with sacred regard. Let's regard it, uh, let's take care of it if it's alive. So with that shift of consciousness from dead to alive, a whole revolution can unfold with that. Many years ago, I was interviewing Joseph Campbell, this historian of global uh, culture, and he asked Campbell, he said, is what people want really greater meaning in their lives? And Campbell replied, no. What people want is the experience of being fully alive. People want the experience of being fully alive. Well, what does that mean? If you're fully alive, probably you're going to be feeling uncomfortable because you're going to be pushing your, the edges of your comfort zone. You're probably going to be a little in danger. You're going to probably be risking a little bit. It isn't a material comfort, it is full aliveness. That's what people want, and that's what the universe wants from us. The universe wants us to be fully alive because when our body dies, what remains is the full aliveness that we experienced, that we grew, that we developed, that the seeds we planted of that aliveness grew in this lifetime. The earth is a living organism. Uh, now we've come to a group, the science says, okay, you're right, it's a self-regulating uh, organism, the, the whole earth. Now we're standing back to, uh, to look at the universe and we're saying, well, the universe, we used to think it was about um, this galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy that we're in, and that's what Einstein thought. And people used to say, well, look, it's all just matter. And if, there's, if you tell me there's anything other than this physical body and, and matter, uh, that's fantasy. Uh, the reality is it's just matter. Well, uh, in the last 10, 15 years, science has discovered that 95% of the known universe is invisible. It's not matter. It's dark energy and it's dark energy. Uh, matter. Dark matter is a contractive force, dark energy is an expansive force, and we here as physical entities are just the top, the icing on the cake. The most of reality is 95% of it is invisible, and it means that 95% of ourselves at least is invisible as well. Well, who are we? If 95% of who I am is invisible, well, there's a lot of aliveness out there that extends far beyond my body.
Consciousness isn't just something in our brains. It is a part of an, a permeating presence that we partake in, we participate in, moment by moment. Uh, American Indians speak of three miracles. The first miracle they speak about is that anything exists at all. It's a miracle that anything is here at all. The second miracle is that living things exist, plants, animals, and other forms of life. The third miracle is that there is life that knows it's alive. It has a reflective consciousness that says, I know I am here. But we've forgotten the first miracle, that there's anything here at all. We just take it for granted. 10,000 years ago, we didn't take it for granted. The people, the indigenous cultures revered, were aware of every act in an indigenous community was an act of power, an act of spirit, because the spirit pervaded everything. We need to reclaim the first two miracles, that there's anything here at all, or that uh, there's life of a form that's beyond us. Now, think of a three-legged stool. If you have a three-legged stool, that is really stable. It'll just sit there on uneven, uneven ground, and it's very stable. Now, if we remove, let's say, two legs of that stool, it's just gonna fall over. It's not stable. So here we are, paying attention just to ourselves, the, the, the one miracle that we have, that we know we're here, and we're forgetting the other two miracles. So we're leaving out two of the legs, the miracle that anything is here at all, and the miracle that plants, animals, and other life exists, and they have a validity, a substantiality that's equal to our own. So um, we're in the process of uh, rediscovering the first two miracles. 50,000 years ago or more, we started in aliveness. And then we became more and more empowered, differentiated, individuated, clearly more and more different from others in terms of our ego structure, our that level of understanding. Um, now, we started in aliveness, and then we moved into the scientific revolution, the revolution in spirituality, the revolution in personal empowerment. And what I see has happened is that uh, science said for, a year, for a, hundreds of years, we're more and more separate from nature, we're more and more separate, we're more and more unique, different. And now we are discovering through the lens of science that the universe is, appears to be alive. Science says, it isn't just empty space out here. Uh, empty space is filled with enormous amounts of energy. And it's creative energy is flowing through the whole universe. And the universe is a regenerative system so that the empty space between us is not simply a static emptiness. It is being created moment by moment by moment by the universe. And what appears to be simple emptiness is actually an extraordinary construction at every moment. And that's seen not only by science, but also by the world's spiritual uh, traditions. This is a deep insight. So another insight from science is that consciousness is a part of the larger ecology. It's a part of the subtle ecology. One expression of aliveness is freedom. And we know now from quantum physics that at the foundations of reality, it's probabilities, not certainties. We know probably what's going to happen, but not certainly what's going to happen, which means it's free. At every moment, we're in a place of freedom. Well, if it's a living system, if the universe is alive, how does it reproduce itself? Well, it turns out that every black hole is probably a gateway into another universe. It's a seed. Our universe has billions of black holes in it, and every one is probably a seed. They're now speculating into another universe. So uh, we're just one of countless other uh, universes that are growing in the mother universe, I would say. There's no delay traveling from here to there. Uh, you bring something into awareness, and through the quantum nature of the universe of complete unity, complete connectivity, we have the ability in an instant to drop into whatever it is that we are exploring. We spend a dozen years giving a young kid a literacy of language 
of words. How about giving them a dozen years exploring a literacy of consciousness and using the technologies that we have now to begin to awaken not just biofeedback, cosmic feedback, where you get feedback from the cosmos that says, "Yeah, you were actually connected. You it, it felt your presence." And when you learn that in a small way, you begin to open in a big way to a universe that's far, far bigger than our physical body. And I think what we are learning is how to live in a living universe. The universe is a living system. We're living systems, and our job is is to grow in our aliveness. And as we grow in our aliveness, what we're growing is the body that lives in the deep ecology of the universe when the physical part dies, and that's the 95 percent that's out there learning to live in the living ecology of the universe. The five percent can can go, no problem.、Uh, the 95 percent can endure、uh, if we have taken our time here on this earth. To reflect upon ourselves, to make friends with ourselves,、uh, to hold ourselves、uh, with love and regard, and then we are growing a a being、uh, with a body in eternity.、Uh, the material and the spiritual or the psycho-spiritual dimensions of life, how to find the balance? And if we think we're living in a dead universe, well then. Where do we find meaning? Where do we find satisfaction? Where do we find our happiness? Well, the media tells us、uh, you are what you consume.、Uh, you consume more, you're going to be happier. Okay, well, I better get that house, the car, the the、uh, the vacation, and all the rest because that's where my happiness lies in a consumer materialistic culture. But what if we're living in a culture of aliveness? Then. Oh, then it gets juicy. Then it gets interesting because we we want to pull back the cover on the superficial aliveness, the superficial comforts, and we are ready to risk our full aliveness, engaging with another person, engaging with animals, with life, with the work that we do, not just a, a, a living, but but to transform, help transform this earth. So.、Um, When we shift from looking at the universe as dead matter and empty space to seeing it as a living presence, and we're a part of that presence, then we're growing a garden. We're farmers of a new kind of reality. There's science that's saying, okay, it is a living system. It's pointing towards aliveness. It doesn't prove it yet, but it's pointing that way. Then we look at people's direct experience. What are people experiencing in life? And it's amazing what's happening. We are measurably waking up as a species. Over 7,000 young people were interviewed about their spiritual experience, and what they came, what they revealed was extraordinary. Over half of them, a majority, said, "I have had a transcendent experience. I've had a transcendent experience. I feel a part of the larger universe." What we were just uh, describing. Uh, uh, in another survey. Uh, roughly 41, almost 50 percent said, "I have had such a powerful spiritual experience; it changed the direction of my entire life." So, what we're seeing right now is tension between the old paradigm of deadness, the new paradigm of aliveness, and they are really in different worlds. But as we move towards aliveness, we're going to move towards a new kind of economy. Where you say, well, I don't. It isn't just stuff. I value aliveness. Where can I get my aliveness?、Uh, well, you can go to nature. You can、uh, be in a, in a powerful、uh, relationship. You can be out there playing with animals. You can do music and do your art.、Uh, there are all kinds of avenues for engaging aliveness and our creative expression of aliveness. And that is where I think we're going to move. And instead of looking for a big car, a big house, and all the rest, we're going to say, you know, here's my painting, here's my music, here's my poetry, and we're going to be sharing. I'm comfortable. I'm comfortably alive. Why should I be fully alive? That's scary. Why should I scare myself, my family? Let's just kind of be conservative. Let's be superficial. Let's hold back. We don't need to、uh, reach out and change the、uh, the nation state somehow because it is changing itself.、Uh, within 
a few years, I expect there's going to be financial breakdowns uh, followed by agricultural uh, breakdowns and that will bring with it uh, famine and with famine migration, with migration, civic unrest and so on. It's a cascading uh, world that we're living in right now. We're already in the leading edge of collapse, period. We, we are already in it and you can see um, the change is underway with climate. It's extraordinary. We could talk about that at some length. There's species extinction, one of the largest extinctions the, uh, the Earth has ever seen. Uh, there's resource depletion. We're running out of uh, cheap water, and water is one of the key things that we need to keep this, uh, this planetary civilization going. So we're impoverishing the biosphere, along with population growth, which is now 7 billion people. When I was born, there were 2.2 billion people on the, on the Earth. It's more than tripled in my lifetime. Now, when you put that together, uh, tripling population growth, high levels of consumption by everyone. We're over-consuming the Earth. There's a, typically a 20-year lag before, for example, climatological forces impact uh, everyday life. So uh, we are living in the climate that was created roughly 20 years ago and we are going to within 20 years be experiencing an extraordinary shift and perturbation in our uh, global climate and that is just going to push us. Uh, we are in way more trouble than we ever thought, way more trouble than we ever thought. And uh, the likelihood of significant extinctions, not only of other species, of plants and animals, but of ourselves is very real. Uh, this is the most historic turn we've ever made as a human family. And the turn is towards, I feel, aliveness. It's not more technology to create more stuff, uh, that's important, I'm not diminishing that, but what we must discover is our humanity, our connection with the larger aliveness of a living universe, and in that, our safety uh, resides. We are getting wisdom from ancient cultures, the Kogi in, in South America. Uh, we're the younger brothers of the Kogi, and they're the elders imparting deep wisdom to us about how we might live more sustainably and happily on this earth. Think about what we have done in 70 years, 1950 to now. In 70 years, we've trashed the planet from the end of World War II to now. That's how long it took to just ruin the place. What is that about? And, and it's about a, once again, it's a living in a living universe. It's drop the arrogance move into a place of mystery and deep regard for what's out here. It is deeply alive. 95% of it is not what you see. So it's to awaken to a new sensibility for who we are and where we are in this evolutionary dynamic. The Koyukon Indians of North Central Alaska lived in a world that watches in a forest of eyes. They believe wherever we are, we are never truly alone because the surroundings, no matter how remote, are aware of our presence and must be treated with respect. I love that. The idea that we're living, there's a forest of eyes. They didn't have the word consciousness. They said, no matter where you are, someone, it's watching. There's eyes everywhere, no matter how far you might be from people and uh, what appears to be life, it is present. So th there was a deep understanding uh, of consciousness in uh, indigenous uh, cultures. The world of a dead universe says, well look, 14 billion years ago this thing got created and it's just the, uh, the cosmic furniture has been rearranged ever since. And we're just a, the remnants of an explosion that happened 14 billion years ago. Now, the person looking at a living universe says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Not only did the Big Bang happen 14 billion years ago, it's happening right now, moment by moment by moment. The universe is being regenerated, recreated at every moment. At every moment, there's new freedom, there's new possibility. What is the nature of the life force that's able to uphold and regenerate an entire universe? This is extraordinary. We take it for granted, but it's an amazing place that we're living in, and the amount of life energy that's flowing through us, in us and through us, is infinite. So from China, 
Buddhism in, in different parts of Asia, the Christian tradition, the Islamic tradition, on and on. They're all saying the same thing. The universe is not a static structure just sitting here over billions of years. No, it's getting recreated moment by moment by moment. And it is an extraordinary amount of life force that's pouring through the universe to make that happen. And it's pouring through us too. This is an amazing place. Uh, it, it looks quiet. But uh, what is actually happening and acknowledged by the world's spiritual traditions is extraordinary. Distintas voces, matices, percepciones sobre una misma indagación: la complejidad de la vida, la enorme velocidad de los procesos humanos, la vitalidad creativa, el entendimiento abriéndose a múltiples dimensiones, la trama misteriosa de corazones que laten al pulso de la tierra. I really believe that science needs to be broader, more inclusive, that it's become very dogmatic and narrow. And this has become a kind of passion in my life. For me, this was a combination of my ideas about morphic resonance and a bigger view of biology, Indian philosophy about nature and mind, and then leading edge research in California about the science of meditation, the science of psychedelics, and the exploration of consciousness the early stages of what we now call consciousness studies. If everything's alive, so what? What difference does it make? Well, the food that you eat, the clothes that you wear, the work that you do, the car that you drive, the house in which you live, the people in which you relate, the politics that you have, all of that is impacted by if I think it's a dead universe and I need to exploit the deadness to get my share of aliveness, boy, I'm going to be competing and exploiting like crazy to get material stuff. Um, and if I think it's, uh, it's alive uh, and, and living, I'm going to be generous. I'm going to be giving into that aliveness, knowing that it's going to be coming back and meeting me. Where we're moving as a species, uh, we're growing up. We're growing from our adolescence, our teenage years, in effect, as a species, and into our early adulthood. We look. One thing that adults do, you have to grow up, take responsibility, and pay attention. Okay, well, what happens in politics? Right now, we have millions of people that are passive. They're not paying attention. The mass media ignores what's happening, for the most part. Uh, well, what if we had an awakening politics? and we were paying attention. And what if we were using the mass media, the television, the radio, the internet as a vehicle of a collective awakening, not distracting, not putting us to sleep, but waking us up. Here's what's happening in climate. Here's what's happening in species extinction, resource depletion, all the rest. Wake up. Take charge of your life, the food that you eat, the clothes that you wear, the, the work that you do, on and on. And uh, people will say, well, what can I do? You know, I'm just one person. Well, look, you're an educator. What are you going to teach? You're an architect. What are you going to build? Uh, you're an engineer. You know, and so on. We each have skills to bring to this world. Uh, so I'm not saying change uh, your, your skill set or whatever. Apply those skills to create a world that works. And this is not for the deep future. This is for now. Uh, we have roughly uh, the coming decade, the decade of the 2020s, in which to engage a world in deep uh, transition. That in the 2020s, we're going to hit an evolutionary wall. And not an ecological wall, physical limits, an evolutionary wall where we run into ourselves and human nature. So this is a time of profound transition for the species, uh, going from deadness to aliveness, but with that turn, what we take with ourselves is new empowerment, new differentiation, new capacities, new skill sets, and then we can come back together, not in exploitation, but in uh, collaboration, cooperation. Let's do this together. This is a team effort. Algunos seres humanos comienzan a sentir la necesidad biológica de estar en armonía con los demás seres vivos y de ayudar a que la inteligencia de la Tierra emerja en cada vez más individuos, de modo que juntos podamos percibir el maravilloso diseño que somos en un todo y parte de la Tierra y del universo. Thank you.